So module 10 finishes up the step process for the new recognition standard. We look at potential steps, or potential issues with steps three, four, and five. Uh, step three, remember, is determining the transaction price. So determining the transaction price, remember this is the exchange price. It's the price of the package that we are exchanging with our consumer. Um, any sort of variable consideration begins to mess with the transaction price. Remember, variable consideration was one of the items that the FASB was trying to get a more consistent and comparable treatment across industries um, with different industries. Because a lot of times these contractual riders were dealt with in various ways. So every industry has its own sort of unique contractual riders. Construction might have incentive payments for early finish. They may have cost plus contracts where the contract is, um, the value of the contract, the value of the exchange price is based not just on the cost of what they have to provide, but also additional items that may arise over the time of performing the contract. Um, entertainment and media has some of its own, um, perhaps with certain thresholds of sales being met, then the uh, owners of the media that have the license get additional kickbacks. Healthcare, Medicare, Medicaid reimbursements for services that have been rendered, uh, and manufacturing gets a lot of volume discounts and product returns that could mess with the actual price that they receive for the items that they are selling. So how do we account for variable consideration? Two methods are put forth by the new standard. One is called the expected outcome method, the other is the most likely amount. Um, the expected outcome method is the logical choice when we have a wide distribution of outcomes. So when we have you know, four or five potential outcomes, then we probably want to use the expected outcome method because it more appropriately weighs our, um, our potential expected values. Uh, we treat it in a statistical sense, which just means that we multiply each outcome the cash amount of each outcome by the probability of realizing it or the likelihood of recognizing it. So for example, uh, it might be 20% likely we will receive 1,000, 40%, 1,500, 30%, 2,000, and 10% likely we'll receive 3,000. In this case, then we would calculate that as each outcome multiplied by its probability added together. 1,000 times 20%, 1,500 times 40, 2,000 times 30, 3,000 times 10, and then we add all those together and it gives me 1,700. This would be the amount that I would record as uh, the modification to my transaction price. The most likely amount is more logical with fewer potential outcomes. So maybe we just have two outcomes or three outcomes. Then we would just take whichever is most likely to occur. In the above example, right? The one that was most likely to occur was 1,500 because it was 40% likely. And so in that case, we take the 1,500 rather than 1,700 as our potential outcome um, that we would record as variable consideration. So I have an example with the Mervidin example that I've been continuing to alter over the steps. Now I say, suppose we have KP Sports contracting with Myrmidon and they're going to want to feature their games on Myrmidon's multi-user platform. They agree to an upfront cost. They're going to pay Myrmidon $400,000 for a year of access. So this is upfront cash price, but they're doing it for a year of access. And so we're going to recognize this over a period of time. And um, they also agree to an additional $120,000 that they'll pay Mervidin if users log more than 15,000 hours on the platform playing their games. Okay. So it's sort of like, yeah, we, we, want to, we want to brand ourselves on your platform. And then if you advertise it and um, you know, your platform is so widespread that we get a lot more play than we would have otherwise, well, then we'll give you an extra kickback. So suppose if it were 75% likely that they will meet that the, that this 15,000 hour mark will be met, then we're going to accrue a bonus rev, rev, uh, bonus receivable on behalf of Myrmidon. So on Myrmidon's books, and always you know understand which company you're accounting for because we're going to start looking at a lot of these exchanges, um, and you need to know which side of the exchange you're on. When it is initially set we would have the cash of 400,000. 
and a deferred revenue of 400,000. Now, how do you account for the bonus? Well, the bonus would be also accreted slowly over the life of the contract. Um, and you know, I, I feel like you can almost do it in two ways. Uh, you can either go month by month and slowly earn the bonus as well as any service revenue. Um, so for example, we wouldn't accrue anything in the, at the outset. And then at the end of the first month, if it was likely that we would have this amount, we would still 75% likely, um, then we would record a month of bonus revenue in, you know, using the $120,000 uh, figure. So in that case then, what we would do is first use the expected outcome of it's $120,000, 75% likely, and $0 is 25% likely, right? And then we have 90,000, zero, so the amount that we would be accruing over time is 90,000. So if these statistics didn't change, um, then we would accrue in the first month 90,000 divided by 12, to just show that one month of revenue accruing, which is 77.5 thousand. So then after the first month, we would be able to accrue a bonus receivable and sales revenue of $7,500, $7,500. Another way that you could account for this would be to log all $90,000 at once and recognize it as deferred revenue And then after one month, so this would happen at the same time. So say this all happened on January 1st, 2016, January 1st, 2016. This would be obviously at January 31st, 2016. Well then after one month, if we recorded it this way, we would lower our deferred revenue and recognize some sales revenue for 7.5,000, 7 7.5,000. Okay. So either you're recognizing the bonus receivable up front, balancing it with a liability, and then reducing the liability over time and recognizing net income, or you're waiting to recognize any of it. After one month, you realize that this bonus receivable accrued at 7.5, and then sales revenue accrued at 7.5. Same overall picture of what's going on it's just whether or not you have the entire receivable i'm sorry the entire receivable and the entire deferred revenue all at once or not the most likely amount in this case would be that we will score the 75 th um, the the one hundred and twenty thousand dollars because it's 75 percent likely and so our outcome that we would record then is the one hundred and twenty thousand. In this case, the cash stays the same because we only are advanced as Mervyn in the cash for using the platform. And then at the end of the first month, again, we could record it two ways. We can either record the entire bonus receivable at 120,000, which would lead to the deferred revenue being recorded at a $120,000 amount, or we could wait and slowly record the $120,000 over time. So at the end of the first month, again, 131.16, we would have a bonus receivable of 10,000 and deferred revenue, I'm sorry, not deferred, sales revenue of 10,000. Now it may occur 
um, it may occur that we don't get this in the end. And if we don't get this in the end, then we simply reverse sales revenue and bonus receivable in this case. Um, in this case, similarly, we would be slowly recognizing over time, right? Deferred revenue and sales revenue. And then we would just recognize a similar reversal of these items over time if it was necessary or if you know at the end we find out we don't hit the 15,000 mark but we have to cancel it and reverse it as soon as we think we're not going to hit this mark right um, in the case of multiple performance obligations this consideration will be applied with the transaction price to each of the obligations so if it wasn't just this one deferred revenue period of time obligation we might have had to attach the additional variable consideration to more than one item. Um, and then you'll see later the variable consideration doesn't include royalties that arise from copyrights or other intellectual property transfers. And so these licenses have their own rules and procedures. In the case of royalties, we don't recognize them until the sales are realized. So for example, you might uh, sell a license to, you're an author, you sell a license or a copyright to your book to a publisher so that they have the rights to publish and sell your novel. Well, as an author, you'll get a certain percent of any sales. Those, that percentage that you earn on those sales is not gonna be realized until the sales are actually um, recorded and paid for by customers. So you don't get to sort of forecast the future and say, well, you know, in the next month, I'll have 30,000, it's most likely that I'll have $30,000 of sales, which gives me a commission of, um, you know, say $3,000, 10% of it. No, you don't get to recognize that ahead of time. You have to wait till the sales are actually recorded before you can recognize it. Okay. One other aspect that could occur when determining the transaction price is a return window. So a lot of times we get a return window when we are generating sales. It does help us generate sales and because of that, we do recognize the cost of this in the same period, if possible, as the sales. So when the likelihood of return is estimable. So, you know, we have some historical uh, facts that we can back up an estimate of how much items are going to be, how many items are going to be returned as, um, after a sale. We would either credit a liability in the case of a cash sale or credit and accounts receivable in the case of a credit sale. Anytime someone returns something to us, uh, or we would recognize that return as a debit to sales returns and allowances, and that's a contra account to sales revenue. So the sales R and A is going to be a contra account that reduces gross sales or gross revenues. That's one of the items that gives me uh, net sales on the income statement. When someone actually returns an item, then we will reduce uh, the liability, we will reduce whatever um, item that we need to, and then credit cash if we return cash, uh, inventory if we replace it with inventory, and we'll look a little bit more into what occurs exactly whenever we get into chapter seven with these items, but I want to sort of open the door and let you see what's going on there, um, and that, that that would be one item. If we don't have an estimable um, historical average to appeal to, then we just wait to recognize revenue until the expiration of the return window. So sometimes we just have to wait because we don't have any records that would indicate how likely it is we are to get a return on these sales. Another item that could mess with the transaction price is a principal agent relationship. Principal agent relationships um, are most aptly sum summarized by just saying working on commission. You know, think of Priceline, think of Hotels.com, think of all these, you know, any sort of travel agent is certainly going to be an agent that is working on behalf of a principal. Now, who's the principal? The principal is the one who's actually providing the products or the services. So, um, you know, if an entity is rendering its own services or selling its own products, it is a principal and it recognizes full revenue. Right? So the hotel recognizes full revenue regardless of how the room was booked. So does an airline. Right. All these people are principals because they're providing the service or the good that the consumer is consuming. 
when the entity is just a facilitator, right? They are just helping the transaction along. So these online booking sites, travel agents are facilitating sales on behalf of airlines and hotels. These are agents. Agents are only allowed to record revenue equal to the commission um, that they charge. And the principal is going to record the revenue less any cost of goods and then the commission itself. So for example, let us um, assume that uh, we are selling uh, an, an airline ticket, right? We are, um, the airline would record, say, a $300 ticket minus, oh, I don't know what the commission would be. Say it is a 5% commission. So then they have to pay the agent who helps them book, who helps the customer book a ticket on the airline, $15. And then let's say that the cost of providing an airline after you divide it across all the customers on the plane turns out to be $150 per person. Well, $300 ticket less the cost of providing the air, the, the providing passage across uh, the Atlantic on your airplane minus the $15 commission would give the airlines amount of gross profit that they would recognize. So in this case, then they would recognize $135. Now, what would the agent, right? The, the airline is the principal in this case. Well, the agent that recorded this would only have $15. And so that's the difference in the amounts that they would record. Notice that the airline would have sales of $300, the agent would have sales of $15, there would be perhaps some cost of, of revenues, but they would probably be netted below this item. And then the commission, of course, they don't charge themselves commission, and so they would get that $15. Now this kind of uh, starts to get problematic when companies don't follow that practice. And there has been one that hasn't. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, a lot of this comes from, again, the ASC 606, that what is the indicator that an entity is an agent? Um, you know, is another party primarily responsible for filling the contract? So the hotel providing the room and board, right? The airline providing the passage on the airplane. Right. They're the ones who are responsible, not the travel agent. So the travel agent is just an agent and the item that they're selling is the principal or the item they're selling on behalf of a party, that party is the principal. Inventory risk. Before or after the good has been ordered by the customer, during shipping or on return. So if there are substantial inventory risks, then the person might be an agent. But if they do not have inventory risks, then it is most likely, I'm sorry, if the person has substantial inventory risks, it is likely they're a principal. If they do not bear these risks, then it's likely they're an agent. Notice that risk indicates ownership in a lot of cases. Who has the discretion in establishing prices? Whoever has the discretion is most likely the principal. The entity's consideration is in the form of commission, right? Any commissions should red flag you to agent status. And the entity is not exposed to credit risk for the amount of receivable from a customer. So if we make a credit sell, it's not the agent's issue to go after that, that credit. Again, this is a, an example of a risk indicating ownership. Um, and then I just talk about Priceline. Priceline is a, a sort of what was caught grossing up their sales by not just recording their commission on tickets, but rather they would record the entire revenue of the sale as if they were a principal. Then they would record any cost of revenues, which was just essentially everything but their commission. And then they would record gross profit as their commission. Right, so this is misleading. You can't record $152 million of sales when you, as an agent, are only truly um, uh, not responsible, that you can only own $18 million of those sales because that was your commission. This is how Priceline should have recorded this. 
And someone might say, well, no big deal, right? Um, they might have started at 152, but they got down to 18 million real quick. So why does it matter if they were at 18 million? Well, remember, first of all, uh, you know, the income statement has a very rigid outline in terms of um, what is your sale? What is your gross profit? If you're offering something that is a good, um, and what are those, those subtotals, remember, uh, indicate sort of persistence across time. Also, if you're, if you're basing your revenues based on the price of tickets, right, the fluctuation in the price of tickets, you're adding in some unnecessary noise when your commission would be much less than that. And so it's hard to get a growth. It's, it's not comparable to other agents in your industry, um, you know, lots of little issues that can occur and it's just not extremely ethical to do this when you are simply an agent right moving on to step four allocation of the transfer price this occur uh, issues around this typically occur when we cannot calculate a standalone price for one of our performance obligations so um you know we need that standalone price in order to determine how much of the transfer price to allocate to each item. And sometimes we just don't sell it on its own, so we don't know. One of the first, one of the first ways typically you want to appeal to that problem is by making what we call an adjusted market assessment. So you just look at a competitor. How much is your competitor offering that performance obligation for? And you know, maybe they sell it on a standalone basis so you can take that estimate. You can also use a valuation model um, in order to determine how much you should be charging for that standalone good. Um, a little bit shakier, but still accepted technique would be the expected cost plus margin. And it's just using this very mechanical association that we know between sale, cost of goods sold, and gross profit. So in this case, remember, you don't know what this individual sale price is, but you might know something about how much it costs to either manufacture it or to buy it. And then you could look at the gross profit by using observable inputs in a marketplace. You know, look at a competitor. How much gross profit are they netting on a similar sale, right? The sum of these two items, right, gross profit and COGS, would give me the sale price. So if I know my cost, I can estimate my profit through a market assessment, then I can come up with a sale price by just adding COGS and gross profit. The final way that you can come up with a standalone price if you don't have one readily available is by using the residual approach. The residual approach relies on the accuracy of the other items being correct. So for example, perhaps you have three performance obligations. You know the standalone price of two of them. You're uncertain about the third. Well then, just take the price that you're offering all three and then subtract off the price, the standalone prices of the two you know, and then that would be a proxy for the standalone price of the third item. Now, it could be inappropriate uh, if, for example, that package price is discounting the standalone prices of the other items and not the item you're calculating. Right. So there is a sort of check you should do on the realm of faithfully depicting the standalone price of the one item you are trying to um, estimate. I'll talk a little bit more about that in this example. So suppose that, you know, we're using this Myrmidon example. Suppose they can't estimate the value of a year subscription. Remember, they offer two years plus the console for $340. So they're not able to get their head around this one standalone item. You know, I had said it was 50, but let's suppose they don't know. So first, let's look at what they might do. So they might go and look at what another competitor is charging. Achilles Gaming is charging $55 for a year subscription. Uh, they also know that the cost of providing the network subscription is $45, and that company's average profit on this is 10% after the services are considered, the cost of these services. Um, and then you can use a residual approach. So what is the value under each of these approaches? The adjusted market assessment is straightforward, right? 
if Achilles is offering it for $55 for a year subscription, then the cost of offering two in the Myrmidon package would be $110. What if we use the um, expected profit plus cost? Or I'm sorry, expected cost plus profit. And I said, all right, well, the cost of providing the su subscription is $45, and they get an average profit of 10%. Right? So if they have an average profit of 10%, that means that 45 is 90% of that. So we have a sales price minus 45 is going to be equal to 10% of the sales price. Right, that's how I came up with that 45 must be 90%. Um, so we have essentially X minus 45 is equal to 0.1X. And then put everything on different sides, 0.9X equals 45 which implies that X equals 50. And again, that's for a one year um, subscription. So we multiply it by two and that would say, all right, let's do a hundred dollars. So let's look at the third approach, the residual. In the residual approach, we know that the console, right? We know that the package was $340. We know that the console is $300 of that. So the console plus two years equals 340, two years of the subscription. Well, then that means that two years of the subscription is going to be 40 bucks. Okay. So is the residual approach appropriate? Probably not, right? We have an assess we have a market adjusted market assessment, we have an expected cost plus profit that are both in the realm of a hundred dollars. And then we have a forty dollar estimate. And so this probably is not not appropriate. We would want to use one of the other approaches. Right. So sometimes the residual just doesn't you know make any sense. And again, the reason why it doesn't make sense in this case would be that you know, this $340 involves a discount, not just to this, which, you know, in, in this case, the residual approach forces all of the discount into whatever you're determining. Whereas it's saying that, you know, there is no discount on the console. It's at its standalone price in this package and everything that's discounted is going to those two years of the subscription. All right. So, uh, that does with steps three and four. We'll look at steps five and also some disclosures in the next video.